In this video, I will describe the characteristics that define a radiographic image. So what makes a high-quality radiographic image? To serve our diagnostic needs, the radiograph should accurately represent the patient's anatomy, replicating its detail, its contrast between tissues, and its geometry. I will introduce measures of image quality and importantly describe how you can maximize the diagnostic quality of your images. A radiographic image can be described in terms of its spatial resolution, contrast resolution, latitude or dynamic range, and degree of distortion. Distortion will be a topic of a subsequent lecture. So let's start with spatial resolution. This is a measure that tells you how well your imaging system can distinguish objects that are closely spaced. Spatial resolution is typically measured as line pairs per millimeter. We can use test objects to measure spatial resolution. These objects consist of thin alternating strips of lead and plastic producing a radiographic image of alternating radiolucent and radiopaque line. In this particular test object, the lead strips are aligned in a radial fashion. The point at which we cannot identify the individual lead strips defines the limit of the spatial resolution of our system. Spatial resolution is measured in line pairs per millimeter. In this example, you have alternating radiolucent and radiopaque lines. The width of each line is 5 millimeters. So 10 millimeters would encompass one radiolucent and one radiopaque line. This yields a spatial resolution of 0.1 line pairs per millimeter. Note that as the lines get thinner and are spaced more closely, you will need a higher spatial resolution in order to discern them as individual lines. So why is spatial resolution important to us? When we do intraoral imaging, we look at fine detailed structures. In the radiograph shown here, you see the periodontal ligament space seen as a radiolucent line and the adjacent cortical bone or lamina dura seen as a thick white line. The detailed assessments that we make on intraoral radiographs requires high resolution. The spatial resolution of a radiographic image is influenced by the focal spot of the X-ray tube, the type of the receptor that we have used to make the image, and by any motion blur by patient or receptor movement. The focal spot size is an important determinant of image resolution. In dental X-ray tubes, the anode is angled so that the effective focal spot size is smaller than the area of X-ray production. The size of the focal spot in dental X-ray tubes varies from 0.4 mm to 0.7 mm. A smaller focal spot size will yield an image with a higher resolution. The type of receptor that we use to record the image is also an important determinant of the spatial resolution. When using F-speed film, the resolutions that were achievable were 20 line pairs per millimeter or higher. The resolution of the digital receptors that we use currently is lower than that of F-speed film. Depending on the vendor, the resolution of CCD or CMOS based systems range from 7 to 15 line pairs per millimeter and the resolution of PSP systems ranges from 6 to 10 line pairs per millimeter. The wide range in the spatial resolution of digital systems emphasizes the need for dentists to be familiar with measures of image quality so that they can appropriately select the receptor system that provides the best image quality. The third determinant of spatial resolution is blurring caused by motion. This may be motion of the patient or of the receptor. In order to minimize motion, we maintain the exposure time to the shortest possible. And that brings back a concept from our study of X-ray production. Milliamperes and seconds both have similar effects on photon number. Thus, setting an exposure time with a higher milliamperage and a lower exposure time minimizes the chances of motion and thus would improve spatial resolution. Note that the determinants of spatial resolution are mostly dependent on the technology that you use for imaging. An X-ray machine with a small focal spot size, an appropriate receptor type to give you high spatial resolution, and an X-ray machine with appropriate milliamperage and time settings so that you can maintain the lowest exposure time to minimize motion. This emphasizes the need for dentists to understand this information so that they can make educated decisions and select the imaging system that provides them the highest quality diagnostic images.
The next measure of image quality is contrast resolution, and this refers to the ability of the imaging system to identify differences in photon attenuation. In a high contrast image, the difference between radio opaque and radiolucent structures is accentuated. In such an image, you have fewer shades of gray and is thus also referred to as a short grayscale image. On the other hand, a low contrast image has more shades of gray and the resultant distinction between radiolucent and radiopaque structures is less distinct. The desired contrast is dependent on our diagnostic task. In a high contrast image, the demarcation between enamel and dentine is enhanced. However, details of the trabecular bone are lost. As you change the grayscale of the image, note that the details of the trabecular bone are more apparent. All vendors of digital imaging equipment provide the ability to make basic adjustments to contrast and density, and we should use these adjustments to increase our efficiency of radiologic evaluation. Remember that differences in photoelectric absorption provide us with radiographic contrast. When doing intraoral imaging, these differences are apparent, providing us contrast between air in the maxillary sinus, the adjacent cortical bone, and between amalgam restorations and the adjacent tooth structure. There are two factors within our control that influence contrast. This includes scattered radiation and the kilovoltage setting that we use for imaging. Let's first consider the influence of scatter. And in this example, we will image an interface between soft tissue and metal to provide us with a high contrast image. Let's assume that there is no scatter. This would yield an image with a high contrast. The metal is represented as radiopaque and the tissue is represented as radiolucent. However, in practicality, there is scatter. Note that the scattered radiation from the tissue reaches the detector and makes the area under the metal less radiopaque. In other words, the scattered radiation reduced image contrast. We cannot completely eliminate scatter. However, we can minimize the amount of scatter radiation that is produced and the amount of scatter radiation that reaches the detector. Note that by adding collimation, that is restricting the beam size to just the area of interest, we decrease the amount of scatter radiation reaching the detector and minimize the adverse effect of scatter on contrast. Also note that collimation will not only improve your image contrast, it will also decrease the radiation exposure to your patient. So the beneficial effects of collimation are both on patient radiation safety as well as image quality. Next, let's look at the effect of KVP on contrast. And in order to provide us contrast, we will image a series of steps. In this scenario, we will start to image the object with the exposure settings of 65 KVP and 10 MA. Let's assume that there are 1000 photons incident on the object and that every block absorbs 40% of the photons. X-ray attenuation is exponential and thus we can calculate the number of photons that would exit at the base of our object. The relative ratios of these photons is what defines contrast and makes our radiographic image. Next, let's increase the KVP. When you increase the KVP, you increase the number of photons as well as the energy of the photons. Thus, you have more than 1000 photons and less than 40% of the photons are absorbed. This simulation demonstrates that by increasing the KVP, you will increase the density of your image and you will decrease the contrast of your image. In the third scenario, we have three different exposure settings. The exposure settings have been adjusted such that the number of photons that exit at the middle step, 360 photons in this case, is constant in all three imaging situations. Thus, the radio density or the grayness of the middle step will be the same in all three images. However, the density of the adjacent steps varies and demonstrates to you that the contrast decreases as KVP increases. Here's a practical application of why we need radiographic contrast in a clinical situation. Caries detection is based on differentiating between normal enamel and dentin and demineralized enamel and dentin. Demineralized enamel and dentin appear radiolucent and thus there is a radiographic contrast between normal structures and carious lesions. The next image characteristic is image latitude and this describes the range of densities that we can see on a radiographic image. On intraoral radiographic images, this range extends from the air in the maxillary sinuses to amalgam restorations.
The type of detector that we use is a strong determinant of the image latitude. Note that these three technologies vary in their response to radiation. First, let's consider film. The dotted lines represent the range of diagnostically useful densities. In order to make an image that is within this diagnostically useful density, there is a very short range of exposure. With CCDs, this range is slightly broader and is shifted to the lower end of the dose range, indicating that we can decrease the radiation exposure needed to make a radiographic image. PSP plates have a linear response to radiation. Due to this linear response, even images that are made at much higher radiation exposures can be digitally adjusted to be visible. This emphasizes the need to establish exposure settings so that we do not inadvertently over-radiate our patients. The overall degree of darkening caused by radiation is referred to as radiographic density. A radiograph with high density is dark, whereas a radiograph with low density is light. We achieve the appropriate radiographic density by adjusting the exposure settings. We do this considering the patient size, the density of the anatomic site that we are imaging, and any pathological conditions that may decrease radiation absorption in the anatomic site that we are imaging. Radiographic density is a function of the number of photons that strike the receptor. By increasing the KVP, the MA, or the seconds, we increase the radiographic density. Now let's consider establishing exposure settings in a practical context. Radiographic films were manufactured with a defined sensitivity or speed, and the speed categories were standard across all manufacturers. However, with digital sensors, no such standard speed exists, and there are vendor-specific variations in the response of the receptor to radiation. This emphasizes the need for exposure settings to be optimized in your clinic. To that end, we can use a standard test object that will allow us to measure spatial resolution, contrast perception, and dynamic range of the image. We then make a series of exposures with different exposure times. Note that the image density decreases as the exposure time decreases. In this test object, we have a series of contrast wells at the top of the image, a line pair resolution phantom at the center of the image, and a step wedge to provide us the range of densities available on the image. And we then use that to select the lowest exposure time at which we can see all of these different features. Also remember that a digital image can be manipulated to enhance some of these features. The selected exposure time is then used for the molar projections and the exposure times for the other anatomic sites are appropriately adjusted from this value. Note that the exposure time used for children is lower than that used for adults. When I look at an image, I remember that image quality is in the eye. I select the X-ray source with the smallest focal spot. I select an appropriate receptor system and I establish exposure settings for radiological protocols. In a future video, we will also discuss the use of proper imaging technique to create high quality radiological images. So in effect, we as the dental team are the primary determinants of image quality.